Welcome to the Liberty Baptist Sermon Archives. The message you're about to hear was preached at Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. You can find out more about us or contact us at mylibertybaptist.org or just look us up on Facebook. And now we hope that this message from God's Word will be a blessing to you. Pergamus and the Trojan Horse. Pergamus and the Trojan Horse. Now, we've probably all heard the term of the Trojan horse, but you may or may not be familiar with all of the intricacies of the story of why it is something that we still make reference to today. Uh, the Trojan horse was a wooden horse said to have been used by the Greeks during the Trojan War to enter the city of Troy and win the war. The Trojan horse is not mentioned in Homer's Iliad with the poem ending before the war is concluded and is only briefly mentioned in the Odyssey. But in the Aeronid by Virgil, after a fruitless 10-year siege, so 10 years of a siege, the Greeks constructed a huge wooden horse at the behest of Odysseus and hid a select force of men inside the horse, including Odysseus himself. The Greeks pretended to sail away, and the Trojans pulled the horse into their city as a victory trophy. But that night, the Greek force crept out of the horse and opened the gate for the remainder of the Greek army, which had sailed back under the cover of darkness. The Greeks, in one night, did what they could not do for 10 years. The Greeks entered through the open gate and destroyed the city and ended the war. And the story of the Trojan horse is something that's still talked about today and it's, uh, referred to today, not even in the sense of what uh, happened here in the story, but even just talking about uh, there are software uh, bugs that are called Trojan horses, and there are other types of things. A, a sneak attack, if you will, uh, something that you don't expect, is typically called a Trojan horse. And the Trojan horse was such a devastating attack because while the people of Troy were able to repel the enemy on the outside, they unwittingly let the enemy inside their walls. No, see, they were able to repel them on the outside, but what they didn't realize is while they were repelling them on the outside, they let them inside the walls. And really, if you are going to let them inside the walls, it doesn't matter how long you can repel them on the outside, you are going to lose the battle and lose the war. Now, Paul talks about a similar issue in the uh, uh, sermon that he gave to the elders of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, when he said this in verses number 29 and 30, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. What's Paul saying? When I leave, when my time here in Ephesus is done and I'm not able to watch over you anymore, I know what's going to happen. There will be people who will try to attack from the outside, but if you're not careful, there will be those who will come in among you from the inside and will also try to devastate you in the exact same way but instead of being clearly seen from the outside, they're going to rise up right from amongst you. In essence, a spiritual Trojan horse. While you're defending the outside, you don't realize what's happening right under your nose. And Paul, in Acts chapter 20, could have been talking about the church of Pergamos here in Revelation chapter number 2, where we are tonight. And as we consider this third church, we see this. They fought so hard against the world uh, outside their church walls that they didn't realize that they had let the world right through the front door. And that's something that I hope will be instructive and helpful to us tonight, to realize that this church at Pergamos fought so hard against the world on the outside that they didn't realize they let the world in right through the front gates of the church. Well, we're here in Revelation chapter number three, uh, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter number two, and we're gonna begin reading in verse number 12, where it says this, and to the angel of the church at Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr and was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly. 
and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. So as we read about this noble church called Pergamos, here in Revelation chapter number two, we're reminded that if we're not careful, we can let the world slip in the front door while we're fighting the world out in the streets. But before we get too far into what they did right and what they did wrong, we, like the other churches so far, we probably should give ourselves a few minutes of background to understand a little bit more about this church at Pergamos. Uh, the church at Pergamos, or rather the city of Pergamos, was a place where art and literature were encouraged. It was a city where there was a library of over 200,000 volumes of books. Now, that's a pretty amazing amount of books even today, but considering that there was no modern printing press uh, like there was today or is today, that was an incredible feat. Uh, later, uh, Antony gave many of these books to Cleopatra. Uh, one historian says the books were made of parchment, which was first here used. Hence the word parchment, which is derived from the name of the town of Pergamos. So we actually get the term parchment from the city of Pergamos that we find here in Revelation chapter number two. The name Pergamos in the Greek means married, married. And while we could probably look at it a few different ways, I think it's interesting that this church was wedded to some doctrines and practices that were wrong. The church, which is to be separate from the world, ended up coming together in union with the world, and that always is going to cause trouble. Pergamos was known for the worship of many gods. Now, I think that's something we're going to see in common with a lot of these cities, isn't it? In the ancient Greek and Roman world, they would have worshipped uh, many gods and demigods. And here uh, in Pergamos, amongst the many gods that they served, uh, one would have been of note, which would have been Asclepius. Uh, Asclepius was the god of medicine and the god of healing. He was represented, listen to this, with a staff and a serpent. Have you ever wondered when you saw a doctor's office uh, why a doctor's office would have a serpent in front of it as a sign? I mean, what's the connection between a serpent, uh, a staff, and a doctor's office? Well, believe it or not, this science-based, a little uh, sarcasm there, this science-based sign that is in front uh, is talking all the way back to the ancient gods uh, of ancient healing, and that's where this comes from. In fact, the son of Apollo and the human princess Coronis, uh, uh, Asclepius, is the Greek demigod of medicine. According to mythology, he was able to restore the health of the sick and to bring the dead back to life. Now think about that. Able to restore the health of the sick and bring the dead back to life. But isn't that exactly the opposite of what Satan does? Who takes the spiritual health of the living and desires them to partake in the second death. Uh, Satan is the one that's the master practitioner of death, uh, not of healing. And, and by the way, in case we're uh, confused about this tonight, Satan is in the background of all false religions. Satan is the father of all false religions, that he is in the background of all of them. And of course, there's been much talk of Satanism and such here in the Boston area, even over the last few days. And uh, there would be those even with that Satan con that took place uh, this weekend. And I hadn't really addressed that on Sunday, and I don't plan on addressing it very much tonight, other than I know that I have read uh, where they say, well, they're not actually worshiping Satan. They're more just a secular group that just wants to meet together, that are anti-government and anti uh, and anti-God. Well, my response to that would be this. Uh, if you are anti-God, then Satan is at the source uh, of your belief system. There is no other way to look at it. But this is what is going on. And as there was false religion in all of these cities, this is the specific strain of false religion that they're dealing with here in Pergamos. Uh, as we see from the text that we read here, uh, ministry was not easily accomplished in Pergamos. It was not easy to plant a church. It was not easy to grow a church. It's not easy anywhere to plant a church, whether it's in Easton or whether it's in Venezuela or, or whether it's in Pergamos in ancient days. It wasn't easy. But yet, despite the difficulties, this church did have some great victories. And we're going to use the outline that we've used 
for the other churches, and we will continue through this study of the seven churches. And the first is we want to look at the good things that happened in Pergamos. There were some very good things. So number one, we see its commendation. Number one, its commendation. And that's found in verses 12 and 13, where it says this, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Now again, we're reminded that this is another way of Jesus Christ to introduce himself. And how does he introduce himself? As the one who is the sword with two edges. Well, why is that remarkable to us? Well, we are reminded that Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Uh, the word is the two-edged sword and John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that the word is Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is reminding us with his link of the word, which is reminding us of his authority and who he is. And so the beginning of this commendation, he says who he is once again, and then continues in verse number 13, I know thy works. Now we've heard this at the other two churches as well. We're going to hear this again. The fact that the Lord sees and the Lord knows our works. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now, this verse tells us this, that they fought Satan himself. It says that they fought it, the Satan's uh, seat, which I believe would be in reference to his throne. Uh, they fought where Satan dwelled. Uh, this is a recurring theme in the chapters that we chapter we've just read and will be in chapter three as well. Uh, it says in uh, Revelation two, verse nine, that he caused the persecution of Smyrna, Satan did. We read right here that he had his seat at Pergamos, Revelation two, 13. We're gonna see in verse number 24 that he taught deep doctrine, quote unquote, <laughs> deep doctrine at Thyatira. And in chapter four, we'll see that he used his own synagogue of false believers to oppose the soul winning efforts at Philadelphia. Meaning this, whenever God's people are on the move, Satan's on the move too. Whenever God's people are trying to do work for the Lord, uh, Satan doesn't like it. It's like building up those Legos and the kid that wants to just kick them down. The, the kid that builds up a sand castle and the one that wants to knock it down. Uh, that's what uh, Satan loves to do. By the way, we've seen God do some fairly wonderful and incredible things here at Liberty Baptist Church over the last few weeks and months, we better be certain that we don't rest on our laurels to the point that we don't, that we just think Satan just given up and said, well, they're on the move. Well, I'll leave them alone and just go bother someone else. I would say we probably need to be even more prepared uh, that Satan would be attacking where we are. They, listen, they ministered in the very seat of Satan. We're reminded, Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's why linking this together with what we preached on on Sunday about loving our enemies, we're reminded that even those who are enemies, listen, the one that we really need to look to as the one that's stirring the pot is none other than Satan. He is the one that is trying to do all of these things. And so we look at those people with love, the love of Christ, trying to win them to Christ, knowing that the only hope they have and the only hope this world has is in Jesus Christ. And Satan is the one that we're wrestling with. Satan is the one that we're fighting with. And they fought at his very seat. They fought at his very throne. Now, if you're like me, you kind of wonder, well, what does that mean? Satan's throne? Satan's seat? What's the connection there? And I'll be honest with you, I, I looked and it's another one of those things that I looked at several different commentaries that I have and I have found and come to this conclusion that nobody agrees on exactly what it meant. I did see that there were some that said uh, they believed maybe Satan's seat was there, quote unquote, because they had a throne-like altar dedicated to the Roman god Zeus. But really nobody knows exactly for sure why it would say in the word that Satan's seat was there and that he dwelleth there. I know this, that's the way it was because the word of God says so. But can I give you the background of why that is? I don't know that I can. But there is something I think that we can draw from this that is important. The mention of Satan's throne reminds us that his seat of power is not in hell. His seat of power is not in hell. I think sometimes people have this idea of Satan in hell 
just calling the shots, kind of like uh, uh, Hitler in his bunker, uh, just kind of hunkered down and, and trying to move troops here and move troops there and just kind of hunkered down until the end finally comes. But no, that's not what we he see here. Satan is active in the affairs of men even today. He dwells here in this realm where we are. Hell will be his final place where he's cast. Uh, he's cast into the lake of fire. We see that in the end of the book of Revelation. And by the way, what an exciting time that'll be when we preach through that. We realize the one who has tortured us and the one who has tempted us and the one who is, has done all of these wicked things, when we, I believe, will see him. When you look at that scene that's there, I believe we will see him being cast into that lake of fire and to know the one who has made our lives miserable in so many ways will not make our lives miserable anymore. I want to be there. I tell you, I, I want to see that for all that it is. Uh, but in the meantime, he's not down there smoking stogies. That, that's not what he's doing. No, he, he's stirring up things even today, uh, whether it's at the Marriott Copley Plaza this weekend or whether it's in Salem or whether it's with a, a witch doctor in some third world country and you say, Pastor, those things don't happen anymore. They still do happen. And I've talked to people who have witnessed it and we have someone in our church who has witnessed it before. We have. And we have to remind ourselves that, although I don't know exactly where Satan's seat is, why it relates to Pergamos and all that, but no, he's active today. And that he's active here, uh, whether it's necessarily here in this building, uh, we know he and his demons are active. And if we just try to pretend like spiritual warfare is not a thing, then he's lulled us to sleep. By the way, if we get to the point where we believe spiritual warfare is not a thing, the door's just wide open and we're just letting Satan come right in. And while we're fighting this war and that war and this culture war and that culture war, and I'm not saying they're irrelevant, what I'm saying is this, while we're doing that and pretend like spiritual warfare is not a thing, we're letting him come right in. He is working in all of those things. That's why 1 Peter 5, 8 says this, be sober. You say, oh, so don't be drunk. Well, yeah, don't be drunk. Right, but that's not what it's talking about. Here it's talking about have a seriousness about you. This is serious. Be sober, be vigilant, pay attention because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. But yet, despite all of this difficulty, they were complimented for resisting the power of Satan. Did you see that in the verse that we just read, verse 13? Thou holdest fast my name, despite all of this. They held fast to the name of Jesus Christ. He's not denied. They had not denied my faith. There certainly will be, I believe, as time goes on, much pressure for people to deny the faith of which they have. And he says, you have not denied my faith. And they kept that faith even under duress. I mean, this was a stressful thing for them to do this. How do I know that? Because here we have mentioned one man named Antipas. It says, thou hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now, who was Antipas, you might ask? And the answer is, I don't know that either. You say, Pastor, what do you know? Well, you can judge that for yourself. Uh, tell me by the time we're done. Actually, well, never mind. But uh, uh, we, we, this is what I know. We don't know. Uh, his name literally means against all. So it makes me think he was independent Baptist. He was just against everything. So uh, against all, that's what it says, his name. But obviously he was against some of the great wickedness that was taking place there. I believe that name just kind of gives us the connotation. He was against the wickedness that was taking place there in Pergamos. But we don't know who he was. We don't know how he died. We can put it this way. He's one of the unsung heroes of the faith. And despite Satan and his attack on Antipas, possibly having caused the church at Pergamos to collapse, what it did was actually galvanized them. It actually brought them together. And many times we find this to be true in the scriptures is that when the church is persecuted, it actually does not cause the church to crumble. It actually caused it to have a backbone of steel. It actually caused it to rise up and to purify itself in humility and in faith and in strength to be able to do what God's called them to do. By the way, in the book of Acts, when the church would not go into Judea and to Samaria and the other most parts of the earth, what came? Persecution. And the Bible says they scattered all over. And what happened? Like seeds just being scattered, the word went everywhere. And so uh, Antipas, even though he was martyred, 
the people stood strong. They didn't renounce their faith. They stood firm in what God had done. This is a great thing. And by the way, one commentator said this about Antipas. Almost no ecclesiastical history makes mention of this martyr Antipas, which argues him to have been a person of obscure note in the world. But Christ seeth and taketh notice of those little ones who belong to him, though the world overlooks them. But Antipas is a hero who, other than this, we know nothing about. You know, there are many who will toil and will serve and will work and will strive for the things of the Lord, whose name will never be on a billboard, whose name will never make one of those magazines, whose name will never make it on a Facebook page, who will never be top billing at a preacher's conference, but yet I believe that they will have great rewards in heaven far ahead of those who have the bright lights and the names and all those things. Why? They're the unsung heroes of the faith. They're the ones in Hebrews chapter 11 where it says in some were sawn asunder and that some uh, were, were uh, martyred for the faith and all these different things. And we don't know who they are, but God knows. And God is the one that keeps the ledger and the records. And so despite all of these things, it's commendation for Pergamos was this. Things were tough. Things were difficult. Satan's seat was there, but you stuck with it. And that's a great thing. However, there was more, if you remember, that we saw. In fact, there was that word, but, that conjunction that comes up at the beginning of verse number 14, meaning this, that there's a complaint to follow. So number two, as we continue our outline that we've been using the last few weeks, we see number two, the complaint. While fighting at the seat of Satan, the pastor has allowed the world to slip through the front door. And I remind you, when I say the pastor, it's because I believe these letters are particularly addressed to the angels of the churches, the messengers, to the pastors. Not that they're not relevant to the whole church, not that they're not for everyone's consumption, that we all can't find application. But can I tell you, I read something like this today, and it just reminds me of the job that God has given me as a pastor to make sure that we're not so busy doing uh, all kinds of stuff on the outside fighting the world. And when I say fight the world, I hope you understand we're not talking about fist fighting and we're not talking about carnal fighting, that we're talking about, could we just put it this way, fighting on our knees more than anything, uh, fighting with the Spirit of God uh, more than anything. We'll accomplish more that way than what we do with any of these other carnal ways. We don't, we're don't. we not going to win the world by fighting like the world. I think we forget that sometimes. We're not going to win the world by fighting like the world. But we can fight the world. Again, to just use that term, you understanding what I mean by that. We can fight the world and a pastor can engage in these skirmishes here and there and everywhere and at the same time realize, not realize, that Satan and his doctrine and his minions are coming in right through the front door. And we have to be so careful. And that's not just a pastor thing. That's something that we all must be careful of. Look at what it says in verse 14. But I have a few things against thee. No, that doesn't sound good. Because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Do you remember Balaam? Uh, do you remember Balaam? Balaam was a hireling prophet who led the people of Israel into sin in return for wealth and the prestige that he received. Remember, he was to curse the people of Israel and God would not allow him to curse Israel. In fact, the more he tried to curse them, the more he blessed them. But then in the very next chapter, we find this, that he encouraged the people uh, to be able to intermingle with the Israelites in fornication, as we see right here. And so because of that, that at Baal Peor, I believe it was 24,000 who died there at Baal Peor because of uh, what they had done. Uh, and Balaam, although he could not curse them, he was in the background kind of working this out so that the people of Israel would stumble and fall. But here we see in Revelation chapter 2, that the doctrine of Balaam is being related to the church at Pergamos. At Pergamos, the church was wedded to the world in order to get worldly advantages. The doctrine of Balaam is the teaching that the people of God can intermarry with the heathen and thus will become what the heathen are. Let me say that again. The doctrine of Balaam is the teaching that the people of God can intermarry with the heathen and thus will become what the heathens are. Now, I'm not just talking about, when I talk about marriage, I'm not even necessarily talking about at the wedding altar. I'm talking about we as a church and we as individuals yoking up together with the world, that we being in lockstep with the world. Listen, to make a difference, we must be different. 
We heard that uh, from Rand Hummel years ago. I use that here often. To make a difference, you must be different. You can't change something by adding more of the same. And we cannot allow the, the world to come into the church and say, well, we'll be more relevant if the world comes in. Well, you know, we'll be more hip if the world comes in. Well, you know, we'll, we'll draw in the target demographic if we allow them to come in. Listen, that's the stuff the business world talks about. That's not what we do as the people of God. No, no, what do we do? We are distinctly different for the purpose of making a difference in this world. If we're just a shadow of what the world is, why would anybody come here? Listen, they'll get the whole dose from the world. They won't get the light version from us. No, but there are people out there who are looking for something different because they know the world is a dog and pony show. They know that's what it is. And they're looking for something that's different. They're looking for something that's real. They're looking, I, I, let me use this word, they're looking for something that's relevant. And when the church typically uses the term relevant, they're talking about becoming more like the world. But if we're to become more quote unquote relevant, then we need to purge ourselves of the world so that we can show them that there is light and there is salt and there's a difference. But they had allowed this doctrine of Balaam, this intermarrying, this intermingling with the world. You can read later, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18, uh, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But verse 17 says this in that great uh, uh, text there, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. The church can never be joined to the world in a search for relevance. In fact, unity... Unity with the world renders the church irrelevant because there's no longer any difference. Unity with the world renders the church irrelevant. And that's the irony is the more the pop culture church today, pop culture Christianity wants to look like the church and sound like the church and, and do covers of uh, modern artists. And I watched a church on Easter Sunday that had uh, a, a show uh, covering Rihanna and they had something that if they had not been told me that it looked that it was a church service, I wouldn't even know it was a church service. It looked like some of the TD Garden. It looked like some of the Great Woods. And it was church. By the way, I wouldn't consider that church. They may have called it church, but it wasn't church. You say, Pastor, are you upset at anybody? I'm not upset at anybody. Just, I, I see that this is something that we must make sure as Christians that we don't allow ourselves to become part of that because the pull of the world is so easy to bring us in. And by, and by the way, let me say this. The world's not just the quote-unquote left. The world can be the quote-unquote right too at times. The world is the world. And I'm not, listen, I, I'm, I'm as conservative as, as you can find. I'm not pol preaching politically tonight. But what I'm saying is this is that we need to make sure that we follow Christ first, that we follow Christ first. Everything else falls in lockstep with that. Everything else has to follow in lockstep with that. Now, if something that is, uh, it, it follows in lockstep with the Word of God, I'm in it. I'm all for it. You, you know, do you know, here's what I mean. Do you know why I'm pro-life? It's not because a political party tells me to. It's because the Word of God says and when people get away from the Word of God, then, well, sorry. We're, we're, we have to make sure we are, are careful about this. If not, what are we doing? We're allowing slowly the doctrine of Balaam to come in. But we are. And so we have to be very, very careful about that. And it's not just the doctrine of Balaam, but it's also the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Look at what it says in verse number 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now, do you remember the Nicolaitans from before? We looked at them in Ephesus. In fact, go back to verse number six, where it says this, but, thou, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You know, what started as deeds in Ephesus grew into a doctrine in Pergamos. And that's the way it works. It starts as just the deeds and it grows. And do you remember the Nicolaitans very likely was that teaching of, laity and clergy, that priestly assumption that took place. And isn't that what happened over time where some 
just kind of, they wanted the preeminence. And before you know it, you have a, a organization that has a priesthood and people that have to confess to that priesthood. Uh, no, th this is not what we see. And this is what happened here. Uh, we likely now in Pergamos, they have a division where you have priests and, well, the regular folks. Now, I, I can't prove that. I, I can't say that. But it does seem like when we take the etymology of the word that we looked at before, that this is probably what was going on there. And they were allowing that to happen. And one commentator said this about whether it was the doctrine of Balaam or whether the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Satan couldn't accomplish much by persecution because many did hold fast, like Antipas. So Satan tried to accomplish his goals by using deception. The strategy was first violence, but then alliance. You get that? The strategy was first violence on the outside. They're violently going to take over. When that doesn't work, then alliance. They come in from the inside. And again, I'm not trying to be distrusting of any entity, of any people, but this is what I will say. The Word of God says this, let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. Which means this, the only fact checker that I care about, and I really don't care about any of them because they're all kind of, well, anyway. Uh, the only fact checking that I'll do is right here. This is where the fact checking needs to be. Because let God be true and every man a liar. Uh, because if it pastors must passes muster of the word of God, then we need to be all in it. And if we see in the word of God, it says don't have it. It doesn't matter how many other churches. It doesn't matter how many other gurus. It doesn't matter how many uh, uh, influencers say, hey, this is what you need to do. Listen, if it's just us and God, then we're still in the majority. By the way, God doesn't need us to be on his side. He's still very much in control whether we get on his side or not. But I'd kind of like to be on his side. And we don't need to be proud about it. We don't need to be haughty about it. We better be humble about it because I'll tell you another way that Satan will come in through the front door is through pride. Because we can be doctrinally orthodox, but yet so full of ourselves because of how pure we are that we have let Satan come through anyway. And I think we saw a little bit of that in Ephesus, didn't we? Because they lost their first love. They were right on. They wouldn't let the Nicolaitans in. That doctrine or that deed, they hated, but they lost their first love. And we've got to be careful uh, about that as well. So we see the commendation. We see the complaint. And then finally, uh, we see the charge. Finally, we see the charge. And that's this. Verse number 16. What's that first word? Repent. You want to know the charge? Repent. It's a sudden, sharp warning. One word. Repent. Why is it so sudden? Well, look at what it says. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Five of the seven churches, believe it or not, are commanded to repent. Five out of the seven that we'll look at are all commanded to repent. And it's a reminder to us that the command of repentance applies to Christians, not just those who first come to Jesus Christ. Repentance is necessary for salvation. And I think we need to remind ourselves of that sometimes. There's another way that Satan's coming into some churches that are just saying, well, repentance is not even necessary uh, for salvation. No, it is necessary to repent of our sins, to understand that we are lost before we're saved. But also understand this, that once I'm saved, I lose fellowship with God when I sin. And so I have to go back to him and say, no, I'm turning away from that. I, not because I, I lost my salvation, and I need to get it back, but because I've lost my sweet fellowship. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, David said. That's what we need. So the message of Pergamos, oh, well, and, and what happens to the true believers, verse 17, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says in the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. We don't know necessarily all of the meanings there. The hidden stone very likely refers to the manna that would have been hidden in the Ark of the Covenant. It makes you wonder that if that Ark of the Covenant will be restored in the uh, Millennial Kingdom, that that would be something that's there. It's very possible. A, a white stone, uh, you know, you've heard the term when someone was blackballed before, meaning that one person who blackballed someone in a vote for membership meant they could no longer be part of a group. Well, what does Jesus Christ do to us when we're saved? When we're the overcomers, he gives us a white stone. That was actually a practice that went back into ancient times. It could be meaning that. 
uh, a new name. Well, I know this, that there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine. You say, well, that's just to him. Well, it's on a biblical truth that our names are written in the book of life. When we are saved, we overcome and we have these wonderful, wonderful joys. The message to Pergamos is relevant to us today. We must resist the compromise of the day. We must also not ex accept compromise in the church of God, which means guarding from the outside and the inside. I'll, I'll give you an illustration from my perspective and then one from your perspective. A couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to uh, witness to a gentleman at a park. I mentioned this to a, a couple of the guys that are here. You know, a park's a great place to uh, to witness to someone, you know, and to be able to just, uh, you know, talk to them. And people are sitting around, parents are sitting around. And so we were sitting around at a park uh, in Attleboro, and I'm watching uh, Peyton, and I'm watching uh, AJ. And they're running around, and a gentleman comes over, and I strike up a conversation about we're from Easton, I'm a pastor. And I do have an advantage of when I get to say I'm a pastor, it opens up a lot of doors for conversations. But I'll say this, you never know where that door's going. And on this day, I had no idea where that door was going. And so he sat there real quiet for a moment, and he looked at me and said this. He says, do you mind if I ask you a question? I said, I'm an open book. I'd love to. And I'm praying as he's talking because I'm thinking this is great. He talked for 20 minutes, and for the life of me, I'm still not sure what the question was because there was no question. He just wanted to teach me. And he was talking about things that were missing in churches. And at first I was kind of with him because I'm thinking there's things that are missing in churches. You know, that's true. And you know, we can talk about the, the truth of the gospel. And I'm trying to talk about the gospel with him. I'm trying to work. I'm trying to work in, in a And there's a couple of times he said, well, well, hold on just a second. I thought, man, this, is my, this must be how you all feel when I preach. It's like, is he ever going to stop so I can say something? Uh, but, uh, but this is, I mean, he kept going and going. I'm trying to give him the gospel. And he finally told me that one of his gifts that he had was to be able to recreate the feeding of the 5,000. And he looked at me and said that at, with, with a straight face. And I wanted to say something if, if I was smart, uh, not if I was intelligent, but if I was trying to be smart, something like, you know, there's a lot of hungry people out here. I mean, just go ahead and go for it now. Uh, but, you know, this was very serious to him. And he's getting up and he's going down. I'm trying to talk to him about this. But then he's talking about all the people he teaches. And then he's talking about his teaching ministry. And he's going through and he's telling me about how he can cure my son of autism. And I won't even go into the details of how he was going to be able to do that, but he could heal uh, AJ of autism. And I tried to give him the gospel every way till Sunday, but he wouldn't let me do it. I had a track in my pocket because that's what I believe, you know, it's good for a Christian to do, to have a track on their person at some point. As I was trying to find a way to give it to him, the Lord prompted me, don't give it to him. I didn't tell him where I was pastored. I say, Pastor, you didn't give him the gospel? I attempted to give him the gospel. I tried very much to give him the gospel, but I had to make a decision. Am I going to allow someone who has blatantly called himself a false teacher? Can I be honest, without being unkind, an emissary of Satan? Well, who tries to recreate the miracles of God? Well, we look in the end of the Revelation and we see it's Satan that tries to. I'm not saying that he was trying to do that on purpose. I'm just saying Satan was using that conversation and is using those things whether he realized it or not. And some don't realize it because some will say, Lord, Lord, did I not? And he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. I had to make a decision. And I'll say, I can't remember many times where I've ever been prompted not to give someone a track. Again, I gave him the gospel as best I could. That was the most important thing. But I knew that if he was to come in this building, it could disrupt the service. He could stand up in the middle of a service and try to preach, disrupt maybe someone trying to hear the gospel and coming to know Christ. So I made what I believe was a calculated decision that hurt my spirit. It hurt my spirit to be able to do that. But I had to make a choice. Am I going to allow the world through the front door? I will say there were other times that the attacks were much more insidious. Pride arrogance. Perhaps doctrines, I, I, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you one that was just a doctrine like, whoa, I don't know that I should have been teaching that. I've taught things before that I've had to retract later on, but not an outright doctrine. That hurt to be able to do it, but I knew it's what the Lord needed me to do. You say, well, pastor, what does that have to do with me? I thought you're preaching to us. I mean, you're just talking about yourself. No, here, here's what I'm saying. Every single one of us 
have to be that vigilant with our own spiritual life. Because you know what Satan's doing? Oh, we fight him on the outside. We don't like this and we don't like that. But then there are Christians who let him in through the television and laugh at the same thing they're against. There are some who will talk about how uh, homosexuality is a sin, but then they'll watch porn with it. I mean, can we just get real here tonight? They're letting the evil one come in. The Bible talks about foolish jestings, literally laughing at the things that we know are wrong. What are we doing? We are encountered with these things all the time. And what do we need to do? Well, not hand it a track. No, I'm not talking about that. Click the X, shut the window. Click the clicker, turn it off. Shut off the phone. No, I'm not going to look at that. I can't. I'm against all of these things on the outward, but oh, in the deep recesses of our mind where he can start playing games. It's not so, not so far away and distant anymore when we think of it like that. It kind of comes right home. And you want to talk about, you want to talk about spiritual warfare. And, and most Christians are just totally unaware of it. Do we not remember Daniel? How he was fasting and praying and the angelic warfare that was taking place during that time? I'm not saying that we need to be looking for those signs and different things all the time, but we just better recognize it's real. What do we do? We need to submit ourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. And what will he do? He will flee from you. It's real. It's real. And families and homes are being destroyed. Churches are being destroyed because they have all the right outward positions, but yet they're letting Satan come right in through the front door. And we've all got to be vigilant. Wise as serpents, but also harmless as doves. Some of us want to be wise as serpents, and have the bite of a serpent. That sounds like a lot more fun, but that's not what the word says. Wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. How do we do that? How do we do any of this? Holy Spirit. And I don't mean to say that glibly like this. No, there is no other way to do it. In my flesh, I can't. Pergamus couldn't on their own. But with the power of the Spirit, resisting the devil, he will flee from us. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of Liberty Baptist Church. If this message was a blessing to you, or if there's any way we can serve you, please let us know by contacting us at info at mylibertybaptist.org, or you can visit us this Sunday at 800 Washington Street in Easton, Massachusetts. May the Lord bless you as you grow in His Word.